Father, what a blessing to be in your house. Lord, the church is the people, no matter where we're gathering, in a, in a quote-unquote church building, in a school, in a home, at Starbucks or Panera, at the gym. That's where your church is, because that's where your spirit is. That is where your people are at. And today we've gathered for one reason, to know you. We want to know you more. Those of us in here that have submitted our lives to you, to following you and enjoying a love relationship with you, I pray, God, that you will reveal more yourself to us today. For the person who is still just kind of sniffing around and kind of wondering who you are, would you open up their understanding more today? That you are indeed a God of love who wants nothing more than to have a relationship with them. You're jealous for them. You simply want your best for their life. I pray that understanding would come to their hearts and minds today. I pray for the broken hearted God that you would comfort them. And for the single person in here today, I pray that you give them wisdom, give them uh, power to, to follow you and avoid the distractions that the enemy would want to kind of get them off track. And finally, Lord, I pray that I would decrease. Holy Spirit, you would take over, minister to your people through your written word. And we'll give you the power and the life, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. How did you coerce your spouse to marry you? Did I say coerce? <laughs> you see, some of you guys are pretty good at that. You gave flowers regularly. You wrote these, you know, these beautiful little notes all the time. And, um, my wife actually would show up at my house like at 5 in the morning, cook me breakfast, and then we'd go to the gym together. Now, she was trying to impress me or something. What do you guys do? What'd you do? Start thinking of that real quick. What were you doing before you proposed? You went to great lengths, I'm sure, a lot of you guys. Speaking of great lengths and speaking of proposal, how did you end up popping the big question when it finally came to the point? How'd you do it? I think I already told you guys that I, when God was giving out romanticism, he forgot to give me any in. I actually asked my wife to marry me, and we were on this mission trip. It was our day off in Honduras. And we were just kind of sitting together, kind of considering what God had done and what he was calling us to. And, and real romantically, I just kind of looked over and said, hey, uh, why don't you marry me or something? Like, in fact, marry me or your toast, you know? And she's, she's like, all right. You know, I mean, it was like the, the least romantic thing that you could ever do. Now, some of you, though, you planned it. You researched it. Speaking of research, and, you know, I think it's, it's almost uh, Valentine's Day. It's getting kind of close, is it not? And maybe some of you guys are actually thinking of popping the big question. I thought I'd help you out because... I knew I needed all the help I could get, so maybe I'll help you out. I found this on the internet here. You can find some cool stuff on the internet. Here you go. Creative ways to ask someone to marry you. Number one, the scavenger hunt. Maybe some of you guys did this one. This is a fun way to pop the question to your loved one. Send her on a scavenger hunt. Throughout her journey, she could revisit important spots, such as the site of your first date or your first kiss. This is a nice way to help your loved one relive your relationship's history before popping the big question. The last clue could direct your future spouse to a location where you are waiting with a ring and an all-important question. Anybody do that one in here? Scavenger hunt? No? None of you guys. Wow, well, maybe, maybe you're not so romantic. All right, here we go. Number two, how about tell the world? Okay, this is another one. Sometimes the most creative and romantic wedding proposals are those that are both subtle and bold. For example, if you can afford it, you might want to invest in a billboard to, to use to pop the question. Think about it. You and your love could take a stroll and you could suddenly point to the billboard and ask if your partner can make out what it says. Anybody done that one? Billboard. Okay, see? So these are some good ideas for you guys coming up. A less expensive route 
maybe to have the question included in an advertisement, crossword puzzle in the local newspaper. That's kind of interesting. But here's my favorite one here. Number three, hiding the ring. I think some of you guys have probably done this one. Hiding the ring is always a surefire way to surprise your loved one with a proposal. You could try topping a cake with the engagement ring or attaching it to your loved one's car keys. Time this well so that you can be with your future spouse when they find the ring. And here's, here's okay, for you guys that are thinking of this one. Be wary of having the ring baked into a cake or slipped into a drink. You don't want your loved one to swallow or choke on the ring. <laughs> yeah. Well, today we, we get an idea of how our God goes about asking us to marry Him. You see, He wants so badly for His creation to simply spend the rest of our lives in a love relationship, a monogamous love relationship with Him. He has sent out the Holy Spirit to woo us to Christ that we might marry Him and enjoy this great relationship. And that it will be blessed and it will be this fruitful thing that goes down. By the way, He's also pretty creative and extravagant when going about this as He sends His Spirit out. In fact, some of you guys are here today, you've been invited by someone, and that's how the Holy Spirit's trying to woo you. He's using that annoying friend that just keeps on, just come to church. you got to come to church one time. And it's been like a year, and you're like, all right, already. I'll come to that crazy, that crazy cult or whatever it is you guys got going on. That's the Holy Spirit wooing you to Christ, saying, man, i got a great plan for you. I want the best for you. Will you come? And so today I just want you to think about two questions as we're going through this teaching. Number one. Will you marry him? And number two, for you believers in here, are you, are you being used by God to draw people to Christ? Are you actively being used by God to draw people to Christ? Or perhaps maybe you're actively in the role of pushing people away from Christ. Consider those questions. Okay, number one, grab a pencil, typology, we got some typology going on. What's typology? Basically, it's some of the things in the Old Testament that are foreshadowing, again, some of the things in the New Testament that are going to go down. In our story today, I want you to write this. Abraham equals God the Father. Abraham equals God the Father. So Abe now is going to represent God the Father, okay? Number two, his servant, or we, and we believe it's Eliezer, according to Genesis 15, Eliezer, or the servant, will be a picture or a representation of God the Holy Spirit. Number three, Isaac. Isaac is a picture or a representation of Jesus Christ, God the Son. Rebecca, in our story, would equal the church, you and I, the bride of Christ. So again, Abe, God the Father, Eliezer, or the, or the servant, his main servant, God the Holy Spirit, Isaac, God the Son, Rebecca, the church. You guys remember in Genesis 22, if you read, you read it a couple, probably a couple weeks ago, and Al actually touched on it in one of his teachings. Do you remember what happened in that story when, when Abraham, when God told Abraham to take his son, his one and only son, and take him to the mountain and to kill him. Do you guys remember that? And he was obedient to that. What, what was going on? That was a foreshadowing. Abraham, God the Father, basically right there, taking Isaac, his one and only son, and sacrificing him on Mount Moriah. That's exactly where he went, right? That was a foreshadowing of exactly what would happen a couple thousand years later on this same mountain, by the way, where Jesus Christ was sacrificed on that mountain. That gives you an idea of what typology is, a foreshadowing of what is to come. And we're going to see that today as we look to Genesis 24. Let's turn there together. Keep those things in mind as we're reading through. Genesis chapter 24, we'll start in verse 1. Now Abraham was old, probably about 140 years old, well advanced in age, 
And the Lord had blessed.